Okay, so uh, last time I was here, a few years ago, I must have done something wrong because it's been a while. <laughs> uh, my incarnation was a uh, poster girl for mental illness. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and just to go over it, I didn't audition for that. It was hoisted upon me. Um, just to explain a little bit and then I'll move forward, is that uh, Comic Relief kind of outed me. I would have never told anybody I had mental illness. This was no act of bravery. But they said, could they take my photograph and use it for their mental health campaign because they send money to uh, mental health charities. So I said, sure. And I thought it was going to be a teeny little postcard size thing. But when I went into the tube station, there was this gigantic poster of me saying, this woman has mental illness. Please help her. <laughs> so I was, I was mortified. And I, I hurled myself in front of it. But it turned out these posters were all over London. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a show and make that look like it's my publicity poster. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, I thought, Rube, you've got a disability. Use it. So just to cut a long story short, I, to I toured mental institutions for the next two years. And I, th I think they loved it. I couldn't. They weren't always facing me. <laughs> and. Uh, and my point was, if you can make a schizophrenic laugh, you're halfway to Broadway. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, what happened was, when I was in the mental institutions, the second half, they, would ask me quest they wouldn't ask me questions. We'd sort of have a dialogue. And then when I moved the show uh, to real theaters with not mentally ill people, uh, <laughs> You know, and the show's gone all over. It's still going all over. It was in Sydney and Cape Town in America. It, uh, those people who supposedly don't have mental illness ask me the same, they have the same questions. Um, that we're all losing it. You know, it isn't just us who are clinically nuts. But uh, nobody can have, nobody has a grip. People do feel like they're losing it. There's too much pressure. They get the same kind of inner voices that we have but just the baby ones, you know, the critical voices, you know, the shouldn't have, I should have, I didn't, you know, why didn't I, I'm such a, everybody has them, that's such a refreshing thing. So I thought, I'm going to go back to school, I've got to go back and find out why the four and four have all this stuff. I mean, there must be a way you can see into the brain, and certainly there is. So I thought, okay, I'm going to crash UCL, uh, I'm going to go on a neuroscience course. So I, I just crashed the course and I told all the other students that I had a disease that made me look really old. <laughs> <laughs> so they'd be my friend. And, uh, and then they found out I really was old. But they still liked me because I was the one that had the car. <laughs> so, so my question is, I, I cannot understand, uh, and then I'll go on with it, why everybody in the world isn't interested in, in brain science or what's going in there. It, it, to me, that's beside wolves. Uh, that's the only thing, really, of interest, is to find out who we are, because you can look in there now. I mean, why isn't this shouted from the, or on the front page of every newspaper? I don't get it. I mean, we're still not bitter. I'm not bitter. But um, the book, The Secret, has sold 80 million copies. <laughs> I just, and the opening page, didn't read it, says uh, that the wisdom of the secret was handed down by the ancient Babylonians. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen very many Babylonians running around, so they couldn't have done that well. And it's 2013. There are books about how to tickle your inner angel. Please, God, help us. I mean... <laughs> But there are scanners, there's brain scanners now where we actually can look in and see how you think. It's extraordinary. And all these hundred billion neurons are constantly changing. They're unwiring, they're re rewiring. And you can change the way you think now. They know this at any age. I mean, isn't that extraordinary? Everything is shifting all the time. Everybody, every human is carrying this equipment, even Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Go figure this. Unbelievable. I mean, you know, genes, we all, but the thing is, now we know we're not uh, destined to, what we come in with the world, we're not destined to have throughout our lives. Even genes change. It's unbelievable. So, I mean, as far as the rest of the body, I will never be in the Bolshoi. You know, I won't do the catwalk because the legs will never get longer no matter how hard I wish or what books I buy that would tell me positive thinking will make them grow. But... The thing is, the brain, it's constantly moving. It's constantly changing shape. And I could tell you why, but I don't have long enough now. Well, it's in my book, <laughs> which you can buy. OK. I'll... And uh, what's extraordinary is it, it changes shape by what you experience and by what you learn, even into old age. 
um, it's just keeping this little baby active, like using a muscle. So, um, and this is called neuroplasticity. So uh, Gloria Gaynor was actually wrong. You cannot, you cannot say I am what I am. <laughs> she was completely wrong. <laughs> but it's gonna be hard when she changes the lyrics to find what rhymes with neuroplasticity. So <laughs> I think a, God, a lot of gay people are gonna be upset. But um, w one thing that I did find that I was very excited about is that, as I said, we all have these critical voices because I thought it was just me. I mean, I, in all of the shows that I've done everywhere, nobody has ever raised their hand and said, I have a voice that says, what a wonderful job I'm doing, and may I say how attractive I am? <laughs> nobody has it. No, and there's a reason why, and I would just give you a little taster. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, when we were roaming around, we needed to be constantly vigilant, you know, always on the lookout for danger. It's similar to all animals, you know, anybody have a cat, you know, how it's always the ears, are, even if you like, you know, think you tamed it, it's still looking for trouble. Well, we were like that too, and we needed to be like that, otherwise we'd be picked off by the latest predator that turned the corner. I mean, and these days, we, if we whistled a happy tune, we would be hit by the next oncoming truck. So we have to have that constant. And then when language came online, we started to put words, and it was not great translations, to this constant fear. But it isn't just something that could kill you. Now it's like, oh, didn't I send an email? Oh, you think my thighs look too fat? Oh, oh, you know. It, so, th and not only that, the danger is on all the time. Because before, you'd kill something, it would be over, or you'd be killed. But now everything is danger. But our insides don't understand that some of the danger is 20,000 miles away. So my question is, how much are we supposed to know in here? You know, we don't have the bandwidth. We can't, how, do, how can I react, and I will react, when I find out there's been a flood and boom, 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 you know, I can't get over there. And then I'll feel even more stressed because what do I have to get a canoe and a hand pump and go there? See, we aren't equipped for this. We're just supposed to know what our neighbor is doing. That's all we're supposed, we're supposed to know is our neighbor having sex with the next person. Four doors down, it doesn't matter. Really, we should limit ourselves. How many murders do you have to know about? You know, just give yourself two or three, that'll be fine. It just, it just doesn't, it's, it's like there's so many windows open in your computer, it's gonna crash. And the other thing is about busyness. Ooh, how much time? I'll, I'll speed up. Busyness is another thing, the thing of never having enough. And again, this was something, it's all because of millions of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, it worked for us. We needed to forage, that's why we kept being busy and looking for the next thing. You know, those are the ones that survived. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the busy ones. The ones who were chilled out, they died. <laughs> They're gone. But you see, now the tables have turned. The winners are the losers. The chilled out ones are fine. <laughs> but it's the ambitious ones who are dying out. We're burning out. And, and part of this thing is, is because we can never get enough. Because everything, you can't just get a pair of shoes. That's not good enough. Now you gotta get the brand. Now you, this is why we can, we can shop all night, all day. This is why there's 20,000 miles of shopping mall. We never shut down. And, and part of this, again, we have all this in common, is that we're fueled with dopamine, which again, got us to the food. But the problem is now, it's a very addictive drug. So when, let's say, I'll put it so we all understand it, well, the women will. When you get a pair of shoes, right, you get this reward, you get this hit of dopamine, but the same thing as when we were foraging for leaves or whatever we were eating back then. This, as soon as you get the shoe, you're already starting to hunt around for the next shoe-rich environment, <laughs> right? These animals, while they were still chewing, they were already hunting around for the next spot. So you'll find it, you'll get the next shoe, you know, even the smell of the shoe, the Jimmy Choo shoe, will set off this kind of dopamine, which is again, if you're at a dinner party and a woman is even wearing a Jimmy Choo shoe, you will get down and gnaw her ankle off. That's how desperate it is. So it isn't actually the getting of the thing, it's the chase, that's the thrill of it. I mean, there's not very many happy addicts. So the unbelievable thing is, we're our own uh, drug dealers. We're providing this chemical and we can't get enough. So the situation is we have no braking system. I mean, we're this evolved. We have this little baby on our heads. It's like we've got a Ferrari up here, but nobody told you how to get the keys. So now we have to learn all this stuff. This is now, so I thought, okay, come on, Ruby. I, I want to really learn how to self-regulate because I'm sick of giving my bank roll to, the, to every shrink I've ever hit to dumping my bank on their feet and running to them at two o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I'd figure out who I was, but then by the time I'd get to the tube, I'd forget again, so I'd have to run back. 
So I thought, I'm going to really learn how to self-regulate. Now, so I looked into this, um, and there were two things that came out really on top, which was uh, CBT, cognitive, based, uh, cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and Mindfulness, only because of the research done in a scanner, not because my angel visited me and told me on the weekend. So I hunted down the guy who um, is the founder of Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, because I have a lot of dopamine, <laughs> so I can do that hunting. So, uh, see, it works for you sometimes, but the other thing is you can't stop. Um, so I found Mark Williams, and I, he taught me mindfulness a little bit. You know, you don't learn it overnight, because it's like you can't go to the gym and do one sit-up, and you've got a six-pack. So I said, well, this is really fascinating, because you could look in the scanner and see what happens when you start to lower the, you know, the cortisol and the adrenaline. So I said, I want some more of this. And he said, well, unfortunately, you'll have to come into Oxford <laughs> and get your master's. So... Uh, I, well, the dopamine came into action again, so I crossed out all my, don't tell them, I crossed out all my bad grades and um, really pu pushed the, the couple that I did really well. He, he said, don't say this, but, and then I give really great interview, so I got in there, and then, uh, and, and to me it's remarkable, I mean, it just works for me, I don't want to sound like an evangelist, but I really wanted to know how I could change my relationship to how I think. Your thinking's never going to change. It's not about people go all, by the way, I'm not the type to ever go after something with, you know, I thought it was a Buddhist thing with the words like mukta mananda, kishna bhatta bhatta, vinanasa handa bhatta, you know, I, I wasn't going to go into that, or, you know, worship some elephant with a thousand arms, or bow to the fat guy, I wasn't going to do that. I'm very skeptical, I really need to see it, or smell it, if you start to tell me where, where my moon is, or what my grandmother, my dead grandmother had a message for me, really, you're, over, you're out of my address book. I may say I'll phone you again, but I'm lying, you're gone. So, uh, so the mindfulness was really, you know, you can't, shop, you can't stop those critical voices, we've established that, but there is a way to maybe uh, have a, see them from a new paradigm. So it's sort of like a radio's on in another room. So you can decide to listen to it, you know, and, and do what it's telling you or sing along, or you can decide just to leave it as background noise. And, and this really becomes fascinating to me. So that if, if for depression, this works really well so that I'm not suddenly hit with the tsunami, but I can hear the little pitter-patter of the early warning system. So this, the same with all thinking. Um, if you... If you really, uh, if you sit, and here's what's interesting, this isn't really a spiritual thing. It's, it's a trick of the brain. When you start to sense that your thinking is changing, and there are different qualities to it, sometimes you need to be in fifth gear, you know, you need to get that next deadline, you need, and God bless us, this is the beauty of the human brain. We can hit deadlines, we can create, we need that doing mind. But the unfortunate thing is, Sometimes you just want to be present, and that's very difficult, because our mind, again, a, re a reward of being human is it can go in the future and it can go into the past, which we need, but we can't get into the present. So this is just a, it's a trick, but unfortunately you have to practice it a lot. When you decide you want to be caught in that future past mind, or you want to, you know, you want to do that 8,000th email, go do it. But when you decide this isn't the right kind of thinking, and I don't mean for the one in four, I mean when you start ruminating, because there are things that you think about that have no answers. Those are the ones that keep you up at night. You know, where you think, why didn't he ever call me back? Why am I so unhappy? Why does Kate Moss have such a good time? She doesn't. Why does everybody, those things, emotional questions have no answer, and it's called rumination. And when you kick into that, the cortisol levels go up, and you will burn your brain out. And eventually, you'll go into that cycle of despair, which could end you up in mental illness. So the thing is to understand how you're thinking. And then sometimes when I see the warning flags going up, it's like having a barometer on the inside of your body. Okay, it's not going to work for everybody. You know, everybody will have to have their own thing. But it is all about looking inside rather than doing three triathlons. Can't even say it. Triathlons. I'm dyslexic. Did I say it right? You can run all you want, but your thoughts are still there. You still have to learn how to manage them when the endorphins come down. So when I see that, you know, the, the thoughts are getting a different quality, I know this is strange, but if you push your focus into your body, there's a part of the brain called the insula, now this is, everybody has it, so don't look at me surprised. So when you feel your body like a stomach ache or you feel your feet on the ground or anything physically, 
it's another part of the brain, it's under language. As soon as you go to one of your senses, the amygdala, the alarm bell, automatically goes down. The cortisol goes down, your heartbeat goes down, your blood goes back to your head and you can think clearly. So let me just say as I finish, uh, I can't teach you this in two seconds. You can also do CBT or yoga or Pilates, anything that pulls you into your body so you're not always up here. But the point of this is if we don't start to learn how to run the mothership, really how to pull the brains, the brakes, the reins, whatever you want to call it. You know, we blame things on global warming or uh, recession or this prime minister, we hate him one week, we love him another week. Uh, we blame it on criminality. It all comes from our brain. This is the mothership. And, I, you know, I really would like to know, I would really be hopeful that in the years to come, it isn't survival of the fittest, but it's survival of the wisest. So thank you very much. Thanks.